Hello. Until now, our attention has been on a CW, that is continuous wave, single mode operation of a laser. We wanted a steady state output, and that is indeed a family of lasers that give the steady state output. But there is another family of lasers which is used very widely. These are pulsed lasers. So what we need to worry about is essentially transient dynamics, that is dynamic that evolves in time. To do this, we'll have to first give up this notion of a single mode oscillation simply because you know from basic Fourier transforms that if I need to describe something short in time, I require a, a range of frequencies to describe that short pulse. Whereas on the other hand, if I have something which is sinusoidal and continuous in time, I just require one frequency. So you see that single mode oscillation is typically would lead uh, to a continuous CW constant uh, intensity output whereas when you are talking about multimode oscillations invariably it will involve transient one of the most important transient effects is something called the relaxation oscillation this has got to do with the fact that imagine i do have a cw constant output laser now if there is a small perturbation what happens to the laser output does the laser you know move away from this stable constant output and does it die out uh, so the way it dies out the way it oscillates has a certain frequency for the transient dynamics and the the time scales at which this transient dynamics die out all of these uh, can be studied uh, i will not get into that aspect uh, at the moment in this lecture but here i will focus simply on the idea of something called q switching i will make some very basic approximations so as to highlight the physics of the uh, notions of Q-switching rather than worry about the details of specific systems. So let me make a few approximations and these are uh, the following. The first thing I make is a plane wave approximation. This is just to keep matters simple. The second approximation which I make is I will ignore the spatial hole burning. I am going to look at a, a uniform field approximation that is, I'm not going to worry about the spatial distribution of field within the cab approximation. I'm assuming that my mirrors are of high reflectivity. So my R's are certainly, certainly much larger than 50% uh, when the lasing occurs. So uh, essentially the approximation is on this, the fields I plus and I minus, they are going to be compatible. That is, if I'm looking at my uh, total intensity I, in that case, I can simply add up the, the intensity of light traveling in the positive z direction and the intensity of light traveling in the negative z direction and the total intensity is going to be simply of the order of about two times either of them, either i plus or i minus, right? That's the kind of approximation that one is making by assuming high reflectivity mirrors. Because now we are talking about both the uh, time varying intensity so let us write down the rate equations that basically capture our description of the active medium and the field within the cavity so i am going to write down equations which are which govern the intensity okay and i am going to write down the equations that govern the uh, populations and uh, these i am going to describe through the rate equations which we are already familiar with because at the moment we are not interested in the spatial distribution of the field the other approximation which i want to make uh, which i should add to the approximations uh, is the following that i want to consider that my the gain medium is equal to the cavity length this is just for simplicity this will simply make my equations you know lose a few extra parameters like small l and so on so gain medium fills the cavity completely so let's look at these equations that govern our intensity as well as the populations so the intensity equation di nu over dt uh, you know what i'm talking about here when i say i nu i'm talking about a narrow band radiation not necessarily single mode but narrow band radiation with the frequency centered around uh, new and then i have the older equations which is c 
small l by capital L g of nu i nu right minus 1 over 2 small l 1 minus r1 r2 times i nu right this is di nu by dt and for simplicity as, I, as you know I have assumed that L is equal to L right so if I put that back in I get the following that this becomes simply this becomes G of nu minus G threshold you would quickly recognize that 1 by 2L 1 minus R1 R2 is indeed my G threshold right so I am writing it in this fashion all right then now let's look at the equations which are governing the populations so again uh, my the scenario is the same I always have my ground state lazing level as 1 upper state as 2 and you see we have already discussed the various level schemes I can for example have a 3 level atom or a 4 level atom all that I want to combine and give that freedom to myself to uh, deal with all such situations so I'm going to write down a slightly general form for the populations which can account for all these uh, variations I have gamma 2 1 as my dk between state 2 to 1 and uh, I have uh, processes dk rates which can for example address the level 1 as well as level 2 right so I'm writing down in this fashion my dn2 over dt remember capital n deal with number density of atoms uh, the rate of change of number density of atoms in the excited state equals minus g of nu times i nu we are looking at number density so i need to divide here this was the flux so this divided by h nu will give me the corresponding flux minus gamma 2 1 right which is the decay from the excited state to the ground state times n2 plus I have put in a sort of a pump or a decay or mechanism pump mechanism that will take my atoms to the excited state in the level 2 right k2 so kt is that pump rate similarly the ground state population dn1 over dt is has the opposite sign to account for stimulated emission as well as the absorption remember g of nu was sigma times n2 minus n1 so that is where the nonlinearity is hidden and this is i nu divided by h nu plus gamma 2 1 times n2 right and i have again added another pump rate this could be you know if it is negative k1 is negative it will take away the population from the ground state like in the four level atom system and it could be zero for the three level system that we discussed earlier and so on so I'm just giving some freedom in form of these uh, rates so these are typically incoherent processes so let me write that out clearly here that my ki gamma ij all of these are incoherent processes that deal with you know either a dk or pump rates right so the, this dk rate uh, this way I would have uh, units of second inverse uh, k as you know clearly would have uh, units of per volume right per second that's a kind of uh, uh, dimensions it would have we of course let me write down g of nu explicitly which we already know of this is simply written as sigma nu times n2 minus n1 and sigma nu if we expand it you know lambda square over 8 pi a21 is the spontaneous emission rate and you have n2 minus n1 and some s of nu which is the line shape function so it could be a line shape function that arises from spontaneous emission or Doppler broadening or anything else of that kind so we are not going to specify that and uh, I have also chosen here that uh, you know my, the degeneracy of the levels is such that g2 by g1 is 1 right so that is something that we are just for simplicity
all right so you see if i want to now look at transient dynamics uh, so uh, though i'm not going to concentrate i can quickly outline for you what one has to do um, so for the for something called the relaxation oscillations uh, i'll just give you the method of how to go about doing it what i do is i take these equations right and uh, look at a simplification for example uh, one can assume uh, that n2 is much much larger than n1 the four level system and so on i'll ignore n1 uh, the other uh, thing i will do is basically go into the steady state right when i get to steady state i will get essentially uh, two numbers that is i've got the equation governing the excited state and i will call that as n2 bar and similarly i will get i nu bar right so steady state intensity and the steady state excited state population right now to do relaxation oscillation one does the following what one does is that i consider that my i nu which is a function of time because i'm interested in the time decay about the steady state so what i'm doing is i'm going to expand my uh, time dependent intensity as some constant which is a steady state value plus a small uh, variation which is could be a function of time similarly i define my n2 right which is my excited state population n2 of t as n2 bar arising from the steady state plus some eta which is a function of time right so these two factors are the ones which are small fluctuations these are such that both epsilon and the corresponding etas are much smaller right than the steady state values of either the population or the intensity these are my uh, global equations which i'll come back to again and again right and these equations is what i'm calling as set number one so what i do is plug back this ansatz into equation number one right once you put it in you rearrange you realize that uh, the equation that is di nu bar by dt all these correspond to the fact that these are steady state values right so uh, one can easily get rid of them and then you will get basically two first order equations in uh, variation in epsilon as well as variation in eta and then you can clearly see that there are going to be terms for example a term like this where there is going to be a a product between the excited state population and the intensity right those will involve a product of epsilon and eta so what one is doing is this is where we do something called linearization which is a very powerful approximation and a technique to understand nonlinear equations about uh, you know some definite large value and fluctuations around it so linearization is what we will implement that is we will ignore uh, products of the kind epsilon times eta and keep only the first order ones right this will ignore uh, with this approximation the nonlinearity can be taken care of and then one gets essentially uh, you know the oscillations of uh, that would happen that epsilon is a function of time as as well as eta is a function of time so uh, essentially i can tell you that the intensity would go like the following this is just the final result which i i don't want to uh, spend too much time on this because i want to focus my attention on um, q switching part of getting a pulse but essentially what i get after doing the linearization i get a epsilon of t which has this form it's exponential minus uh, gamma t by 2 times cosine omega t plus phi you know this is the kind of form you get essentially what this is telling me is that this epsilon of t is going to die out in time at a inverse of gamma and you see this gamma actually depends on the uh, the, the cross section the pumping k2 and the 
loss in the cavity G threshold. Similarly, the omega, so this uh, frequency of oscillation would just be uh, of this kind, which is omega naught square minus gamma square by 4, where my omega naught, by the way, is uh, going to again dependent on the cross section, on the gain threshold, but now also on the intensity. If you think of it in, in time, what is going to happen is that my intensity, you know, I knew bar, so uh, there is a value of the intensity which is there and if there are these, you know, um, perturbations that switch on, then what would happen is the fact that you would have these oscillations, you know, sort of die out and this decay which we are seeing, right, this exponential decay that we would get is precisely governed by this rate gamma and the oscillations that one is seeing is precisely governed by the amount of intensity in this. So this is how it is borne out and you see that lots of these lasers actually show these, you know, these oscillations and one essentially reaches the steady state value which is let's say I nu bar. So you, if there are forays away from it, these variations basically die out in time to give you back the steady state output in time. This is what is called as a relaxation oscillation. It's typical time scale, uh, you know, for example, a ruby laser would be, you know, in the regions of microseconds, uh, 10 power minus 6 of a second. That's the kind of durations and intensities that one talks about. So that's how this transient dynamics uh, occurs. All right, so now I want to talk about uh, Q switching. Uh, you will see that uh, first I will, uh, so I will again consider uh, the equation set number one. So we are looking at a following mechanism for Q switching. Let me indicate this in, in time, what precisely one is trying to do. So this is just a pictorial representation of it and we will capture this mathematically uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, but the idea is the following. So the following is done for Q switching. We keep the pump on, right? So this is my pump and the pump remains on all through. And what one does is to now switch the loss in the cavity. That is, you introduce an extra loss within the cavity. Um, so what happens is that the quality factor of the cavity, right? It decreases tremendously. So remember that quality factor, um, like we defined earlier, one over two uh, new right over delta nu c was the width of the cavity decay that is if i leave the photons within a the cavity they would exponentially decay out and that would result in a line shape which is lorenzian and you see that this lorenzian line shape has a width delta nu c so smaller the delta nu c i write sharper is the cavity resonance and also slower is the decay right greater is the value of delta nu c there is the decay through the cavity is going to be faster. So this quantity quality factor, what one is doing is introducing extra loss in the system. So this my red curve shows extra loss. And suddenly at a certain point, I switch my loss back to the usual values of the G threshold. So remember that for our laser, uh, we cannot switch the law loss to zero. But remember there was this value. So let me call that the G threshold. This is my usual G threshold required, uh, you know, uh, in my lasing system. So what is going to happen is the following, right? So now if you track, if you track the population, what is going to happen to the population is that, so you see that population would go from a, this is my, I'm talking about N2 minus N1, the population inversion. So it will keep on growing. And then you see that this population, the, the excited state is metastable. So at the most, there is going to be losses due to spontaneous emission, but lasing is not going to start simply because the loss is still larger than the gains. I'm looking at delta n as a function of time. Delta n 
is a population inversion which is n2 minus n1 and this is varying in time so delta n keeps building until it reaches a scenario where suddenly you see that there is a huge amount of gain right this gain is of uh, this order above the threshold because I'm comparing delta n with my n threshold so this is my this value is n threshold right so when this there's a large gain and you see suddenly what is going to happen is that uh, at this moment moment you are switched the the cavity is going to see a large amount of population in the excited state and suddenly there is going to be immense amount of feedback which is possible because the uh, the loss in the system has decreased right it has become a good cavity so what is going to happen is that intensity of the light within the cavity is going to rise tremendously right and as it rises it is going to draw out the population and decrease the uh, decrease the population inversion so you see that this is going to come down and you know it's going to come down beyond a certain value right uh, which is precisely when uh, it has you know uh, it has reached the gain threshold value right because it's still being drawn and as it reaches beyond the gain threshold you see the pulse is going to die out and you know, this is going to be kind of the intensity as a function of time profile for the, the output pulse the, again in the next cycle what has happened is my uh, the population inversion has been exhausted the, again the pumping is certainly on and you see that the uh, population inversion would build up right then the next cycle of reduction of the uh, of the loss in the system that is you are switching the quality factor of the cavity from low quality factor to a large quality factor and then again there is a build up of the intensity at the cost of this very large gain right until the value where the population is below the gain threshold or population threshold and then the pulse will switch off so you see you will get these periodic pulses depending on the period at which you switch the uh, quality factor of the cavity and this is essentially what is Q switching so what we are utilizing is this very central fact of the laser that you cannot start lasing until the losses have been overcome if the losses are large you can keep building but you are not going to build up the lasing that is what is happening in this uh, early period until the population builds up it is only within this short time uh, that you see that uh, you realize because you have switched now to a high quality factor cavity suddenly the loss has come down and there is a tremendous gain that has already been built up and that is what is drawn in this very short period so remember that these are not time scales which are comparable so this pulses right these are you know of the order of you know nanoseconds and when we are looking at these other time scales that is between pumping uh, this can be uh, milliseconds that's the kind of time scale one is talking about so these are these are really a thousand times smaller time scale of the pulse duration whereas in between pulses you're talking about a extremely large time which is required to build up the population inversion from the pumping so this is what is the notion of getting these short pulses so indeed the central idea is to switch the quality factor of the cavity and that is precisely what is done so now given the time scales of this problem let us also realize that within the time of the pulse uh, there is little of importance other than the fact that there is large gain and there is a large outcoupling of the light right there is hardly anything else that plays an important role within the duration of the pulse so in the sense that the pumping or the spontaneous emission within this pulse duration is uh, really irrelevant uh, what governs is only the population dynamics and that is something we want to capture in our mathematics I hope the idea is clear and now I'll go to the mathematical description of Q switching so again I make a few assumptions the assumptions is the following 
that my spontaneous emission rate okay my pump uh, these are negligible during the giant pulse which i get we are also stating the following fact during the pulse what we have done is we have built up n2 to be much much larger than than n1 so in a sense i am neglecting in my simple model again remember that this is a simple mathematical model the population in the ground state during the pulse right so given these approximations i can write down for the q switching the governing equations right so di nu over dt now it is simply c times sigma nu now this n2 minus n1 i am neglecting n1 so it's n2 times i nu minus c times g threshold times i nu yeah that's a loss of the photons the rate equation governing the excited state is simply minus sigma by h nu times again i have neglected n1 n2 times nu and then these two terms i am going to neglect but i am just writing it down for completeness n2 plus k2 remember this is the and this i am going to neglect during the pulse so essentially i have this equation and i have this part of the equation right these are the two equations that are most relevant during the uh, the creation of this giant pulse due to quality factor switching right the, you can clearly see that this is extremely non linear to compute this it is very good notion whenever we use a computational tool to basically normalize and non dimensionalize all my physical quantities so what it does is to bring some sanity to the numbers that we are dealing with for example you see there is suddenly we have the Planck's constant that is 10 to the power minus 34. You have frequency which is 10 to the power of 14. So these are extremely large numbers which can really mess up, uh, you know, uh, your computational uh, implementation of these equations because these are non-linear. We have to resort to a computer, and hence it's a good idea to non-dimensionalize or to appropriately normalize. each of these physical quantities with something physical so let us just do that and this is a uh, i am doing it explicitly so that you learn this technique and this should be applied to all computational simulations that you undertake for physical phenomena uh, one should not deal with numbers you know which are extremely varied in their order of magnitude one should basically try and normalize it to reasonable numbers which a computer can deal with more important idea here is the once you normalize and also non dimensionalize quantities there is this physics that comes out very naturally in the problem so the physics governing that problem pops out of this normalization very naturally and this is something that we will look at and we will understand as i go along so let me call this equation number 2 and let me call this equation number Three, right? So let us look at first the equation number two. I have d i nu over d t. First, just let's look at time. So the time scales of interest within the pulse is largely governed by the the threshold loss, right? Threshold loss is a rate, and that is the governing loss within the duration of the pulse, right? So I do the following. I multiply this. this equation number 2 by a quantity which is 1 by c times g threshold remember g threshold was in length inverse c times g threshold will simply give me 1 over time in and i'm multiplying the time at the bottom of this di nu over dt so what i have done is i have the non dimensionalized time itself now i know that on the top i have got intensity if i am looking at n2 which is the number density of atoms in the excited state clearly you see that i should probably rather than looking at absolute numbers of n2 i should look at it as a ratio of n2 divided by the n threshold required for 
uh, for lasing right so if i look at this ratio this would make a same number rather than looking at the absolute values of n2 themselves right so you see that the moment i do this i can replace my g threshold as sigma times n threshold right and that already tells me that you know my sigma gets cancelled my n threshold so basically i am left with i nu by c which is sitting on both sides of this this equation i multiply my both my left and right hand side by this factor so which is if i just take energy and multiply it by a number which is my n threshold and identify this just as an aside remember that you know, intensity was simply the photon flux right multiplied by the the energy uh, value so let me write down all the um, so n2 my n threshold so here i have 1 over volume by 1 over volume right so this is non dimensionalized this is the quantity i am calling as y then i have got c times g threshold so what i have got here in terms of uh, so i have got length over time and i have got 1 over length that is my g threshold and multiplied by time itself so this becomes my new non dimensional time scale now let's look at i nu divided by the c times h nu times n threshold so again let's look at the dimensionality of it all so what i have got is energy right per unit time per unit area right it's as energy flux that is my intensity this i have divided with length times energy so that takes care of the energy part and one uh, length is gone and this is essentially 1 over volume so you see that this area and length give rise to a volume and uh, i have this length over time is my speed of light so you see that this becomes a non dimensional quantity which i call x so what i have done is essentially a non dimensionalized everything so i am going to uh, you know simply rewrite this carefully down so what i have got is the following d by d of c g threshold t correct and this is d of dt of i nu divided by c h nu n threshold this on the right hand side is going to give me sigma times n2 right minus g threshold by so this is c times g threshold that is c times g threshold here and this is multiplied by i nu right so i should be careful i have got a c here as well right that's what was missing so i do have c and c here and uh, so c my c getting the shot there and my i nu again has been divided by c h nu by n threshold here g threshold is 
simply sigma times n threshold so I can rewrite my I can quickly identify that this term is same as my definition x it's non-dimensional this is precisely the same term I can write this as x then you have the other terms so for example this term n2 divided by n threshold right this term is y and I get a 1 here right so this this cancels my c times this is simply tau so my d by d tau of x is simply y minus 1 whole thing multiplied by x non-dimensionalize this is my equation number 4 absolutely similarly let us undertake the next equation right which was I'm looking at now the equation number 3 which is simpler so I have d n2 over dt minus sigma nu times n2 times i nu divided by h nu so what I do here is multiply right on both sides first thing I do is to multiply by 1 by c g threshold this to take care of the time part and then I multiply by 1 over n threshold right so I do the same thing here I divide this by n threshold and multiply this by c times g threshold and you will see that quickly I can identify all of these quantities simply because now this set for example dt and this this will turn out and give me d by d tau right and then if I'm looking at this ratio n2 by n threshold n2 by n threshold that will give me the the quantity y and absolutely on similar lines if I'm looking at my i nu so my i nu happens to be i nu divided by c times so there is a c times h nu and then rather than g threshold which is same as sigma times you know n threshold so sigma gets cancelled and I get an n threshold here so all these quantities will effectively go and uh, you can you can check this for yourself what I will get is the following I will get dy over d tau as simply minus x times y right so I have identified appropriately you know the exactly the same set of uh, notation this is important that I have defined x which is the non-dimensionalized intensity and I have defined the non-dimensionalized population and these are the two important definitions and I also non-dimensionalize the time right so these three allow us to look at this in a very succinct uh, and neat manner so the so we have obtained now non-dimensionalized equations and you can clearly see this x times y is that nonlinear product that we have to start worrying about right so let us see what we can how we can undertake the numerical simulation just looking at these two equations and see whether one can solve them I request you to try out either you know through MATLAB or any other software try and solve these two equations you can also use a method called the Range Kutta which allows you to integrate basically uh, first order time dependent equations
and you can simply give an initial condition a reasonable initial condition let us see what that is and then see what we what we get so i am looking at the onset of the pulse so i am claiming the following this is my initial conditions for these two equations so i am not here capturing the the switching of the quality factor itself the q switching part but what i am saying is that i have somehow ensured that the, my population this is n2 by n threshold right at time t equal to 0 is uh, twice as much it's a non dimensional quantity twice that would mean that if my n threshold was a certain value i have created population inversion twice that amount at the initial time when when the switching happens so let me just uh, note here the the times let me say that my t1 is the time at which you know i am starting my simulations right this is my time t equal to 0 here t2 is the time when it peaks the pulse peaks and t3 you know when it the pulse uh, the pulse is over this particular feature is what i'm trying to capture uh, in my simulation right so at time t equal to 0 what i mean is at time t1 that is at the beginning of the pulse what i have ensured is that my the amount of population delta n or n2 is twice as large as n threshold that is precisely what i am saying that this value is reasonably have it as a value of 2 now of course at time t equal to 0 one can also state that so my x at time t equal to 0 if i set it to 0 i'll be in trouble because you see look at the equations if i set x to 0 dy by d tau will remain a constant this equation is not going to evolve right but uh, you see that uh, you require you you see that dx over d tau you know y is larger than 1 clearly is going to lead to a positive coefficient to x so this is going to increase x but if i have x equal to 0 here uh, this second equation is not going to really evolve right so i need to put in some small value of x so the value of x at time t equal to 0 i have we can assume it as a very small number and let that be about uh, 10 to the power of minus 4 and then you see that this is the following result that you get i have plotted on the left the the inversion right which is the the population itself uh, n2 by the n threshold and we have at t equal to 0 uh, remember that it is uh, here and then you see as the time evolves you can clearly see that the equations dy over d tau which is a population actually the as time evolves it decreases whatever be the value of x and y x is beginning at a very small value so it is indeed evolving so y actually comes down so that's the nature of it and at the same time you see that the when y is greater than 1 you see that there is a positive pre coefficient to x so you see that x grows this is my pulse right so the pulse grows until you see that y's value comes down below 1 right that is when the pulse starts decreasing and this is precisely what happens so you see that typically you can clearly see that this is where the dynamics is going to work on my left hand side i have shown the population ratios on the right hand side i have shown the non dimensionalized intensity right so that the peak value is about 0.3 you see uh, we are beginning with a very small value of the pulse that is at uh, the intensity which is 10 to the minus 4 and then this is the kind of uh, thing you can do it by using the rangekuta method and you can clearly see that typically one is looking at you know width of the pulse so let us say it's roughly about you know uh, in units of tau this is roughly about uh, 4 right so let us keep that in mind and let's estimate what we have got here so this is this is going to be an uh, interesting exercise we have got that my tau is of the order of let's say 4 that would mean that my that simply tells me that my t is 4 divided by 3 times 10 to the power of 8 
because I am taking my G threshold to be 1, right, in the units of 1. So remember that this is, is about 13 nanoseconds, right? 13 into 10 to the power of 9 seconds. So that's the kind of number that you get. Now look at uh, the value of x. Remember that my x, the peak intensity is about 0 0.3. That means my I nu peak, right? This implies that my I nu peak is simply C times H nu times n threshold times 0 0.3 which by the way I can quickly rewrite as c square h by lambda let's look at maybe a ruby laser and we can put in these numbers there and I can write down this as g threshold by sigma for the ruby laser and this is 0 0.3 Right, so let me give you some typical numbers related to the ruby laser. Right, so for the ruby laser, uh, sigma, as you know, was of the order of 10 to the power minus 20. If you recall, we have done a problem earlier centimeter square. You have R1 of 1, R2, let's say, of about 0 0.9, just to keep matters simple. You have length of of the gain medium 5 centimeters. Remember, with this, one can get a G threshold of 0 0.01 centimeter inverse. So that my C times G threshold is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 second inverse, which is what we used here. So if you plug in these numbers, you will see that what you get here is about 10 to the power of 9 watts per centimeter square right now if you think about what is the energy content in such a pulse right you have a energy so imagine that i have a energy uh, where i'm looking at the intensity i peak and it's a squarish pulse so intensity multiplied by the pulse duration right and let's say that my beam cross section, that's my area of the beam is about 0.1 centimeter square, right? Remember that is how, uh, because that's a typical width of that beam. You see that this number here would come out to be about one joule, right? That is the kind of energy content in a pulse. And this is the typical numbers. Now clearly we had made assumption that within this nanosecond duration, the pumping and all the other, you know, the spontaneous emission rates, all those of course really don't make uh, too much of uh, too much difference, because remember that the spontaneous emission rate was in sort of in milliseconds, and we are talking about a pulse which is only about nanoseconds. So ignoring the uh, the the pump and the spontaneous emission was indeed uh, true, right? So that is precisely what uh, governs a, a buildup of a giant pulse due to Q switching. In the next lecture, I'm going to talk about the physical mechanisms to achieve Q switching.